Hello, everyone, and welcome. Like, we are here today with Kelly Totten and Kelly and Butler, uh, both uh, curators and coordinators and creators uh, of this beautiful exhibition that we have now in the Craft Council Gallery. Uh, they're going to talk about the project and they're going to talk about uh, the process of creation and just in an informal conversation. And I really appreciate everyone that could join us tonight. Uh, and before we start, and I pass the word on to Kelly Totten, uh, I would like to read our land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge the territory in which the Craft Council Gallery is located as the ancestral homelands of the Beothuk and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and Beothuk. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatukavut and the Inu of Nijsinan and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all the people of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. As I said, thank you so much for being here and Kelly, the word is with you. Great, thank you so much Bruno and thank you for hosting this conversation, but also this exhibit and this uh, experience as we'll talk about in just a second. So, so just for just to let you know how uh, we planned this for tonight, um, I'll speak a little bit about um, the class and the exhibit that we, um, that the graduate students from um, the Folklore Museums class put on. And then most of, the, and hopefully I'll do that quite briefly. I'll try to be brief. And then Kellyanne um, will spend, the rest of the time we'll be talking about the Wampum Belt and with Kellyanne. We'll have a conversation. We'll have plenty of time at the end for questions. Um, and so, and I think you can type them in the chat as well um, and, or just type that you have a question and Bruno will, will monitor, that, uh, monitor that for us. I can't, I can't read chats and talk um, as it turns out. So, um, so my name's Kelly Totten. I'm a professor of folklore here at Memorial University and quite new. Uh, I think I'm still new here. This is my third year um, here, but also in the province and then also in Canada. I'm coming from the US. Um, and so this has been, uh, we talk about the relationships that we're, we're striving to build too. And this has been a great experience just for me and my learning and um, building relationships um, with Kellyanne and, and with the province through this belt. So I'm really grateful for that. And so I do wanna start with my thanks and that and I think that first, um, first goes to Kellyanne um, Butler who this project would, and I'll talk about it in just a second too about how it came to be, but this project would not have happened. The students would not have had this opportunity to do an exhibit without Kellyanne, without all of her help, without all of her time, um, endless time, and, and just generosity and kindness with teaching us and, and sharing her materials and this great project. Um, so thanks to Kellyanne and thanks to also the Grenfell Student Indigenous Student Caucus, who we haven't met. I don't know if any individuals are here from there. I'd like to meet you guys. Um, but I feel like we've met you somewhat through this belt um, as well. And then of course, thanks to Bruno and to the Craft Council um, and then to Dr. Holly Everett, the um, department head and my colleagues in the folklore department, um, and also Anne-Marie Gushu and um, Margie Chafe, our, our fearless administrators who help really make these things happen. Um, but thank you very much to, to all of these folks. Um, so I wanna start off, as I mentioned, this was part of a course that I'm teaching this semester, still ongoing, um, Folklore 6400, for those who want the number. Um, but it's a folklore museums class. Um, and the idea came about, you know, well before COVID and um, spoke to Bruno at some point in, I think, 2019 or maybe early 2020 um, and, and talked about doing this exhibit with the class and having an open space. And so that was a great idea then. And then COVID happened and I won't spend a lot of time or I'll try not to on this as you know, everything changes, everything changed for us and it was continually being adapted. And so, um, so there were a lot of, of, of challenges um, with this and, and mostly it was a remote, you know, it's still being taught remotely. Um, so even, even as we started the semester though, it was remote but we could still get into the space and I had two graduate assistants um, who, were, who were helping. Um, so we thought they could be in the space and then everything kind of changed with that. But I think they did a remarkable job 
in bringing this together and the time they put in um, doing that remotely anyway. So I just wanna say, so the way that I um, structured the class or you know that each of the students are the curators of this class. Um, and so there's eight students, graduate students, both masters and PhD students. Um, they're coming from, from all over. Um, so six of the eight students are in St. John's physically now, you know, um, in, in their rooms, I guess. And um, one is in, one student is on the West Coast in the Kadroi Valley, and then one is in um, Israel, Rose, who I saw just logged on earlier too. So Rose is coming four and a half hours, um, I can't do the math now, ahead of us in the future time zone, um, also working remotely too. And so the, um, the eight students, the eight curators of this exhibit are Rose um, Baru, Roshni Caputo Nimbark, um, Katie Crane, Robin Lacey, Karen Murray Burquist, Nadia Sarwar, Megan Webb, and Juliana Young. And I know um, because of the evening time, a lot of them couldn't be here tonight, but, um, but you will see their work. Hopefully, if you haven't been to the exhibit, you'll be able to visit it in person over the next two weeks or, um, or visit the, the virtual exhibit that they put together. So partly, um, you know, we were in teaching and trying to teach exhibit, it's teaching exhibit design, but also exhibit research and trying to, trying to figure out how to pull all these lessons into a course, but also create this exhibit and have this experience for the students. Those were my, my goals that were, um, some added challenges, of course, came in with, with COVID. And as I was trying to um, figure out how I'm going to do this remotely, quite frankly, you know, all my original plans are out the window. So I had to try and figure something out. And at some point in the fall, I was talking to Kellyanne. We were having a meeting actually with my colleague Jillian and about some different things. But Kellyanne started talking about this project with the Wampum Belt. And I was like, well, hold on. At the end of this meeting, can you stay on? Because uh, I, can, can we put that on exhibit, you know, because she it just was so interesting and I, you know, and so we, we had a conversation and we've had many conversations since that I, I really, I feel so lucky to have had and, um, and so as she started telling more and more and sort of peeling back all these interesting stories just from her own experience, even where she's at in this moment too, it just, it became quite clear that this would be a great opportunity for, for all of us, you know, for um, for the students, but and um, but I think for all of us who are here, right? And um, and so so it was really wonderful to have that opportunity, but also to have Kelly Ann there, her willingness and generosity to guide us, because you know we we're putting together this exhibit in six weeks, and that's not enough time for anything, let alone doing doing the kind of research you know that that needs to be done, particularly. You know, when working with communities outside of your own, particularly with working with, and Kellyanne, I think we'll talk about this indigenous, indigenizing education. And so this kind of relationship building and you need to have time in those relationships. And so, um, so Kellyanne was able to help guide us and share these materials with us and be a co-curator of this exhibit. So, um, so that was really important to the experience. And I think, um, I think the students will agree they all got this out of it as well too. Um, and so what they did, the students divided up into three groups and they created exhibit plans. And so they each presented then these exhibit plans in the class and, um, and it was fascinating the ways that they were the same and the ways that they were different. How we all have, were, you know, saw Kellyanne's materials, had conversations with her, learned from her, and then how they interpreted these, um, these materials to create an exhibit. And then from those three exhibits, we all just, you know, they had to tell me their three favorite things, you know, and it was interesting how those overlapped and how they didn't and how those all got integrated into this exhibit that you see. And so once, once they presented those three, then we kind of synthesized the ideas and then presented a plan to Kellyanne. And, um, and then it, it went from there and the students, um, the students worked on, you know, continually editing the text and then and then really, you know, and, and working with Kellyanne back and forth kind of to make sure we had it right. We had, um, we were representing this well too and some of it. And then, and then we also got shut down in the middle of this too. So there's some new things to consider and to figure out. And, and so the students really um, 
rose to that occasion, I think quite nicely. And, and we're able to still figure it out in our silos, but I love the theme of this belt is we're all connected. And I think they really figured out how to connect with one another despite or you know in the face of that too. Um, I, I hope they felt that way. I think talking to some of them, um, particularly a few things that I hope you'll um, we can you know pay attention to maybe when you see it in person or um, or on on the web. But there are a few elements that um, came from the the design. One is this um, bead mobile that um, Megan Webb made. Um, but really, two of the groups had this idea of the beads. Uh, kind of had envisioned this bead mobile. So that was one of the interesting things that came out of those three different plans that two of the groups separately on their own sort of imagine this, um, this mobile and, it, and then it, it came or beads hanging from the ceiling in some fashion. And so it became the, it became this mobile that Megan Webb created out of the beads. And she strung a few of those quote real beads, but the from the shell beads um, that, that maybe we can talk about too, or we talk about in the exhibit. There's the mural when you, or I call it the mural, but when you walk in the title and it's of the three main symbols, um, and that Robin Lacey painted on there. And it was really important to paint them, not to just print them. And we, we thought we were gonna have to print them, but we figured out how to do this safely, you know, in, for Robin to go in. She went in with her husband actually in her bubble. So she did get an assistant um, to be able to paint these on the walls. And, and that was a really important element to have that hand stroke, you know, and to have it, to have somebody physically there part of it, um, creating these large symbols that are part of the belt, having those highlighted to be kind of the main, um, the main iconography that you see. Um, oh, thanks, Bruno, great. Yeah, so those are painted by Robin Lacey. Um, and then you also have, Bruno already mentioned on the story wall, uh, or I'm calling it the story wall, but it's, a, it's kind of to mimic the loom um, oh, this is lovely. Thank you, Bruno, showing the images. But um, on one of the walls is, um, here's the mobile. mobile. Um, and then on one of the walls as you go, there's a kind of the blank, you know, the blank warp that you can add your own image, your own design to. Um, and so, and that was, again, that was brought up, you know, one of the ideas from one of the groups. And Juliana Young, who also helped install the exhibit and was, um, you know, one of the graduate assistants, but also put a lot of time, a lot of time and work into this exhibit. Um, so she built out that, that story wall, that loom that you'll see. And then Katie Crane um, took all of these elements and all the materials and built it into a virtual, um, a, the virtual exhibit that you see. And part of the choices she made and, and the group made in thinking about that virtual exhibit was that it could be a very easily editable thing. There's some constraints to it that make it a little harder maybe because it's a very easy to edit, easy to manage website. So that now will go to um, Kellyanne and to the student caucus, the indigenous student caucus so that it can be continued and updated with new stories and that it can be an ongoing um, exhibit. So it won't just stop, we hope with, with this. Um, so I think I want to I want to stop there. I, I I brushed over some of the main elements of the like the design. What I'm even talking about with these designs that go in the story because I'd like for Kellyanne to explain those stories, um, why those designs were chosen and what the Wampum Belt actually means. So I think right now it'd be nice to go to um, to Kellyanne and you tell us about the project and then we can have questions afterwards too. And then of course if you have questions for me. <laughs> Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> so I, I want to say a few thank yous as well. And I, I'm, it'll end up being that we took up a lot of time saying thank you, but that's part of the wonderfulness of the whole process. Um, I, so many things have happened with this wampum belt that have happened organically. And that is, for me, that is um, a, such a wonderful way for things to happen, um, to make some plans, but then you end up... <laughs> going down different pathways. And um, so I, I want to thank um, Kelly uh, for, you know, exactly how she described, you know, we were having conversations about something else. I happened to mention the belt and, and then it was like, okay, we need to talk. <laughs> um, I have an idea, you know, and, um, 
And, and then just kind of went back and forth over the next couple of months about what this might be. And, um, and I was in a place where I was a little bit um, depressed is probably too strong of a word. I was a little bit unhappy that we, we, we spent years with this project um, purposefully slowly weaving on this belt so that the, the bigger number of communities and people could have a chance at it. <clears throat> um, and then when we got to the point where it, we were saying, okay, we've got about eight to 10 inches left to weave, um, let's try to finish it up this spring. That was my goal. This was in 2020. Um, and literally the week that I was scheduling for people to come in and start weaving again, was the week that we were all sent home. Um, and I thought like, what a sad way for this to end after such a lovely five years of um, being interactive and having people on and off participating and engaging with this belt. So when, so when the conversation happened with Kelly and Jillian and Kelly said, you know, like I have this idea, it was a, a way to, give more life to the belts um, in the, in the, in this time period where we aren't, you know, we're not able to really travel or visit with one another. Um, it was a chance that more people could see it, but, and at the time, of course, we were, we were sort of in that phase of um, less restrictions because we had gone a good period of time without a large number of cases. And so we were thinking, galleries will be open, people will be able to go in. Um, and, and the planning started with the students. I was completely blown away um, with the creativity and the interest of the students. And to, to have a project that I feel like, this is a community project, but I feel super uh, like protective of it. And, um, you know, it's gonna be hard to like, physically put the belt on the wall when it's finally uh, you know the weaving part is finished and it goes up because it's I've been carrying it around and taking care of it and worrying about it and to give that to a group of people um and and have them you know give their own take on something uh, and have it be so beautiful <laughs> was amazing to me. Just when I sat there and they were telling me the ideas and the just in the descriptions, even before I saw the physical layout and before I saw the exhibition put up, when they were describing these cascading beads <laughs> hanging from a mobile, and I was just like, oh, this is so amazing. So so the 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 wampum belt project, um, there are some descriptions um, about it on the both on the website and on some of the Facebook pages, but this started out in 2015. Um, I was new to the university. I was in a role that was, um, and I was at the Grenfell campus on the West Coast and, and in the role where I was tasked with uh, helping to indigenize the academy to educate um, students, staff and faculty about indigenous peoples, cultures, and histories. But I was also tasked with engagement with communities. And, and so I thought the way that I do things is, is I want things to overlap, not have a bunch of separate things that you're doing, but you can do one big project that, that covers all of these things. And um, wampum belts are a part of Mi'kmaq history. Um, it's not limited to Mi'kmaq people, but, but Mi'kmaq people um, are one of the groups that have historically um, made wampum belts and, and used wampum belts. Um, and so I thought, okay, Grenfell campus is situated in Mi'kmaq territory. Um, how can we figure out a way to use that principle or, or ideas around wampum belts to kind of initiate more interactions across communities? Um, and a number of universities and other educational institutions have been using um, what they call like wampum principles. Um, and so using symbol symbolic um, representations of belts or the, the concept behind treaty, which is part of wampum belts, 
but I thought like we, we should actually just make a wampum belt. Like that should be what we do. We actually make the belt and carry it around and different people put the beads on, different people put the designs together and actually work as a community, even though we wouldn't all be in one room at one time, move the belt around, um, go to different communities, have people who want to weave on the belt, weave on it. So we did that for five years. Um, and it took off. So it started off with very little interest. And I think that that had a lot to do with people just not really knowing what I was talking about when I said wampum belt and I would have, you know, posters up that I'm going to give a presentation about this wampum belt project and literally nobody showed up a few times. Um, once it got started and then, you know, one person talked to another person and, um, a group of ladies in Cornerbrook started coming pretty regularly to campus um, at lunchtime and just asking, can we have wampum belt for an hour? <laughs> um, and I went to different communities. Um, I see Vanda in the, in the video um, little icons here. And um, that was one of the places that, that we took the belt was into Central for um, a Mauiomi, I think in 2017, maybe I took the belt there. Um, different events that involved groups of people. So um, powwow, Mauiomis, um, I think that like Indigenous Day celebrations in Cornerbrook went into schools, went to Labrador a few times, um, to different interpretation centers in the province, St. John's campus. Um, and so here we were at, in 2020, um, and not really knowing how, I, I had this idea, I'm gonna be sitting alone in my apartment finishing all the weaving. <laughs> and, and it's supposed to be community-based and, and it doesn't seem right. And so this suggestion about um, the exhibition was just like, okay, this is just a fantastic idea. And I really, um, the way that it, the way that it looks just the just the in that space is so um I, I for me it's just so energizing and the different ways that the students thought of incorporating visitors to the gallery into the process so even if you are not able to physically go um there is a website now that the students created uh and you can put comments on the website and you can tell a story on the website. If you go into the space in the gallery, there is a place for you. Um, and we're gonna see it here in a minute uh, on this video, but there's a place for you to add uh, your story to, um, to a piece that is hanging on the wall and then to sign the book that all of the weavers have signed. And so the people who visit the gallery will then be participants in the story of the belt themselves. So you can see that right there, that piece right there. Um, that's where people can clip their stories. And so now that the alert levels are changing again and more people will be permitted to enter the gallery, um, that's a possibility to happen as well. Um, so there still is some weaving to do. Um, and that was another conversation that we were having because the, the type of restrictions that we've been under haven't really been conducive to working together weaving on a belt because you literally sit across from one another and leaning in and your faces are very close together and it's, um, it's difficult to imagine in a, in a situation where we are under different types of guidelines. So, that may not end up happening, or maybe it will, but, um, but, the, but the belt has this um, new audience now. And I, and, and I, I think it's really, the, the theme of the belt is that we're all connected. Um, and I'm really, it's interesting to me to just see the names that I have seen. I don't see everyone's name because they're, not everyone's showing on the same screen, but it's interesting to see some of the people that I have I have interacted with in different contexts. Um, and some of you have woven on the belt and some of you I know from different, different places and yet here we all are in this space talking about 
um, this belt now, and and we are so we are all connected. I mean, there's just this. Um, I think that that's something we need to start focusing on more, <laughs> and less on the ways that we are so different from one another, um, in still respecting those differences. But I'm 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 thrilled about what's happening right now with the belt. I hope that people will visit the website that the students created and ask questions, um, make suggestions, share stories. Um, and, you know, the belt still does need to finish being woven. And so once the exhibition ends, that doesn't mean that that's the end of people's ability to access the belt because um, there will still be opportunities for people to weave um, and eventually it will be hung at Grenfell campus outside of the Indigenous Resource Center, um, but the website will continue. Um, and so there's a whole other phase to the belt. Um, wampum belts are um, storytelling mechanisms that are, um, they're like written records of oral history. And they actually, even though they are a form of writing in terms of the weaving um, with the symbols, they reinforce oral history and its importance. So you have the belt with the symbols on it, um, but it requires a person to interpret the stories. And in Mi'kmaq history, that person is called a Bedus, um, and and it's spelled like a P with Peter, like a P from Peter, P-U-T-U -U apostrophe S, but it, it sounds like a hard B sound. So it's Budus. And that means that person carries those stories and then at periodic celebrations, or if it's um, like, if it's a treaty belt that you're talking about, then whenever there are proceedings related to that, that's the person who comes out and can tell the whole story. So you can look at a, a wampum belt and you can look at various symbols and you have your own idea of what they might mean, um, but there is a specific detailed story behind it. So the next phase of all of this in the project is that if the weaving is complete, that doesn't necessarily mean that the belt is finished. The belt is never really finished. Um, and we still need to collect the stories that go with all of the symbols. So we have the brief versions of those stories, but we want to have um, the people involved to actually tell those stories in some sort of gathering, uh, record those stories, and, and of course with their permission, and then have them available to help educate people in the province about all of the indigenous groups in the province and how we are all interconnected. Um, Wampum tradition is not part of Inuit or Inu uh, cultures, as far as I know, but all of the indigenous groups of the province, including the Biothic, are included in the belt, but it's grounded in Mi'kmaq history because that's where Grenfell campus is situated. So when you see the belt, you see that in the very center is the Mi'kmaq symbol for human being, Olnu. Um, on the far left of the belt is the Inukshuk, which is to represent the Inuit peoples on the North Coast and the South Coast. And then when we finish the belt on the far right will be um, a snowshoe and that symbolizes Inu peoples in Labrador. Um, and there's also a Beothic canoe on the belt. Um, and we have two small symbols left to weave. One is a whale um, and that is for the Northern Peninsula port area, uh, and then a basket, a spruce root basket. And I just wanna quickly um, talk about that one specifically and just in the way that stories are told on this belt. So the Mi'kmaq peoples and, and many different indigenous um, groups have a long history of basket weaving. Um, Mi'kmaq peoples have a tradition of spruce root baskets, among other types of weaving. Um, and there is a, a lovely man from um, the Bay St. George area, a Mi'kmaq man who is part of that spruce root basket tradition. And he and his father, um, so Anthony White is the father, Danny White is the son. He and his father were featured 
um, in the early 1980s in a video that was produced by Memorial University. And I think it was possibly part of an intangible heritage um, category of, of gathering information, but they were in, involved in this um, video. And last year, or maybe it was 2019, it had to be 2019, um, in the Bay St. George area, the Bay St. George Cultural Revival Committee, which I'm a member of, um, we got funding through Canada Council of the Arts and we brought Danny in. Um, his father has, has passed, since passed, but Danny is still doing basket weaving and he came in and did workshops um, and taught people how to make these baskets. And we made a documentary, um, a short, short film. Um, Evan Butler was the filmmaker that was part of our committee at the time. And so it was Danny's sister who then, so we put this call out asking for people to submit stories and designs to, to go on this belt. Um, and so Danny's sister, Jackie, um, contacted me with the idea of putting the basket on. And I mean, it was a fabulous idea because there's a huge amount of history behind that. Um, but that's just one example. So all these different symbols on the belt have a connection to some sort of history or story, mostly about indigenous peoples, but not all about indigenous peoples. So um, anyway, that I won't go on too much more um, on that because I could talk about each symbol for a while, but um, that's just one example of um, the way that history is portrayed in the belt. And I think that's, I, I don't know, that's a, a, a narrative uh, and a half, I think, of some of the things about the belt. I don't know if Kelly has any questions or anyone else. Well, yeah, I, I want to mention there are a couple, um, a couple of the students were able to do some interviews. So you can see on the website, a couple of the interviews start to show up there with um, Arlene White and Mildred Lavers, or Lavers, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing her name. Um, and so there are more stories still to come, right? And so this is a great, that's, you know, um, this question, this is one of our, we've talked about a lot too, this question of the belt's never finished, right? And I, I love this because as a material culture specialist, scholar, I love to think about objects and this idea that objects are never final or finished. You know, I study craft and craft, you know, we think that the object's done, but this, the belt really, questions that when is an object when is the belt finished and we um maybe do you want to talk about a little bit kellyanne about that the kind of continuing on or you just did but the um we talked about some of the elements that are on display of not being done yet what that yeah means. i i would like to talk about that and i i also want to just make sure um that i'm I, I, so that everyone knows that the belt that we have created it is not, um, it's not a ceremonial belt. Um, I don't want people to think that we're presuming something in, in creating this belt. Um, it is a community belt. Um, it's designed to educate people. And, um, and I had, so when I started the project, um, the, I think the common thing that people asked me was when are you going to finish it or how long is this going to take kind of thing and I think that's just a normal reaction um and I didn't have an answer because that had I I didn't care um uh you know I mean it, it was about who am I connecting with how many people get to participate and if we put a call out and ask people to send in designs um if it takes a long time for some people to respond or um, to, for me to travel to different places to weave, then that's how long it takes. Like it takes however long it takes. And, um, and so, and it has caused some, a, a little bit of tension in sometimes where people kind of seem a little frustrated, um, not people in the community necessarily, but a little frustration with, I thought this was gonna be done by now. <laughs> um, but it's, it's about the connections between the people. It's about the stories that people share. Um, it's about how I, you know, I took the belt to St. George's um, and a women's group there. 
they, they added two designs. They gave me their drawn designs. They wove on a particular part of the belt, but then they gave me this design. And um, I then when I went up to the Northern Peninsula and had a group of people up there weaving on it, it was the women's group on the Northern Peninsula was weaving the design that the women's group from St. George's had designed. And so then there was a conversation about that and I was telling them who had submitted the design. And I was up in um, the youth center in Sheshi and I had these little four-year-old girls um, totally not shy weaving with this giant doll needle. Um, and I was telling them that this man named Elder Calvin White had submitted the design that they were weaving on. And so then they wanted to know all about him. Um, and before I left, they asked me to take their picture and they said, you have to tell Mr. Calvin about us. And so um, it was that kind of stuff was what was really important about the project and not necessarily a timeline. Um, and so in terms of, um, you know, what looks finished or not, what one of the things that I love about the way that the belt is displayed right now is number one, it's not finished, um, but also it's in half finished stages in different parts of the belt. So there's um, each of the, each of the rows that is woven is, is woven with a new piece of sinew. And that was a suggestion of a student after we started, because he said, what if a bead somewhere along the line breaks and you have to undo something to repair it? Wouldn't it make more sense if we used a new piece of sinew for every row and tied it off so then if you had to fix one row, you only have to undo one thread and you're not undoing a whole, you know, and I said, that's fantastic. Let's do it that way. So, but what that means is that on every single row, you have these tails of sinew hanging that you then eventually have to weave back into the belt so that they're not showing. And currently, uh, the way the belt is at the gallery is, you know, the first half of the weaving, all the all of the ends are woven in and it looks clean, you know, it looks clean on the edges. Um, and then there's this whole section with this like shaggy, unkempt looking shards of sinew hanging off of it. And I love that. I love that it's on display that way. And that I wasn't worried or that Bruno or Kelly weren't saying, Don't, do you wanna make that look nicer? <laughs> like that's how it looks, that's what it is. That's, that's the condition that it's in right now. Um, and eventually before it goes up into this case that it's gonna get put into, of course, all of that will get woven in, but I love that it can sit in that gallery space just as it is and, and people can approach it that way. That's great. It'll be interesting to hear too, even when it's in the case, how, how, cause it's right outside the student caucus, the indigenous student caucus. Is that correct? Yeah. So how the different students who go there, what that belt starts to mean to them and um, cause it will change their space as well, which is really nice. I think. Um, Bruno mentioned that there's a, a, there's some comments or a question from the chat. So maybe we can, we have about 10 minutes left at sound. I think so we can have time for that. I have more questions. I can continue to ask too. So if, um, but this is, I've asked them already, <laughs> you know, I've had a lot of time to talk to Kellyanne, so I want others to have a chance. Yeah, so we do have a, a comment. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this explanation and for, for these insight into the history of the project. And, and like, as you said, like it is beautiful to see the unfinished product. Uh, it's something that I have the pleasure to be seeing that for the last two weeks that is in the gallery every day that I go to work and it's just stunning. Uh, and yeah, so we do have a, a comment. Um, it says that the belt feels like a real gift when you see it in the gallery. I really appreciate the collective effort that went into the weaving and the exhibition. Can you tell me more about the process? How many people have contributed to the weaving and beating of the belt so far? That's a good question, thank you. Um, more than 400 people have worked on the belt. Um, so that includes people who contributed designs and maybe did not actually weave. 
Um, and then people who wove on the belt and maybe did not submit a design. And um, in many cases, so to weave a one row on the belt is um, for a person who knows how to weave, one row is going to take at least 10 minutes. Um, so people who come and work on the belt generally were not weaving an entire row. It would usually be a few beads at a time and then the next person would do a few beads. Um, some people did get really excited and sit down and do it for 20, 30 minutes. Um, but that's how we ended up with more than 400 um, people. And, and we have kept a guest book, um, which is in the gallery. And um, I love that book as well, because it has a bunch of super neatly written names. And, and then you open, you turn the page and it's children have written across four rows, their names really big. And um, it's awesome. Um, so we have a record of everyone. And um, uh, yeah, so more than 400 people. Uh, so we have another comment saying connection is everything. Thank you for the reminder that cooperation is so beautiful. And we have one coming that it says, the weaving of the belt may be completed, but I can't help but feel that it won't be finished because its story will con always continue, which I think is something that you've been talking. Thank you, yeah, that's nice to hear from other people though too, thank you. Does anyone want to open their mics and, and ask a question? to either Kellyanne or Kelly Tolton. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say that I think this is a wonderful project and I've thoroughly enjoyed listening um, to this presentation. And uh, I mean, I'm, I love weaving, first of all, I'm a nerd, <laughs> but, but I love the aspect that, uh, that, you know, they're both Kelly, but Kellyanne talked about um, when someone asked if it was finished and I was like, oh yes. And I, I just love that it's not about uh, the final project or the final object. It's really rooted deep in process and um, community and communication. And through that, like so much happens and then everyone's hands coming together to contribute. It's just a really beautiful sentiment. And uh, I really, I think it's beautiful. Thank you. I appreciate that. If I can jump in after what Jessica just said, um, when I saw that this event was happening and I, I couldn't believe it because in some of the things that uh, Kelly Butler said earlier, um, I'm one of the 400 who did a very little part of that belt. And in fact, it's how I met Kelly. And it the, the time that I spent um, that weekend uh, has stayed with me and changed so much for me in, a, in, a, in ways I can't even articulate now. Um, but the sense of community and connections and stories, um, like even to see, to see pictures of it now. And, uh, and, and I guess the biggest thing for, like, to thank Kelly for literally carrying it for so long. It's, um, it's, it's, it's really incredible to, uh, to be a part of it. Thank you. And can I ask you, Michelle, was that at a language camp that you? Yep. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I thought and it was. Yeah, and from there, you know, I've, I've taken courses from Kelly and it's been just the beginning of a, a fascinating personal journey, really, so. Awesome. Do we have any other comments or questions? Oh, there we go. We have one. Will the bell travel outside the province at any point in the future? That is an excellent question. And I will say, um, I so I don't work for Grenfell campus anymore. <laughs> I work at the St. John's campus now. So my ability to say, where the belt can go <laughs> might not, I, I probably shouldn't presume anything, but I, I will say, um, I, I don't think that anything is off, off 
limits or out of the realm of possibilities um, because it has had this very organic journey since the beginning. And I think that that will likely um, continue to be true. Okay, and another one. With the restrictions of COVID and having the belt travel so much on its own, do you feel that has actually strengthened the connection with community members and the belt itself or any comments on that? I'm glad you asked that question because I, I, I was thinking about commenting on this, um, it, but then it didn't come out in all of my other comments. One of the things about COVID and, and what has happened now with, um, you know, in any situation where all of a sudden you're thinking, okay, we can't do all of this in person, or maybe that parts of it can be in person and parts of it can't, is it forces you to be creative. And we've all learned a lot about <laughs> Zoom and WebEx and Skype and whatnot over the past year. Uh, even if we were using it before, we know more about it now. Uh, and I think what has happened with this ex exhibition is um, it has, in a, in a weird way, it has really opened up access, um, even though it's not in-person access. But um, the, the virtual um, tour, the website that the students have created, um, this conversation right now um, are ways that people who are not in the proximity of St. John's are able to participate. And so, um, I, you know, I can't go traveling from community to community right now with the belt. However, we've now figured out a different way for the belt to have a presence um, and for people to engage. And, you know, there are, there's a number of us here right now on this call, but there are also other people who weren't available tonight and are anxiously waiting for the um, for this to be posted in the next few days so that they can watch it after the fact. So I, I think there's something that we've learned um, in this past year about accessibility and trying to be more accessible. And even when we go back to hopefully some type of normal in-person interactions in everyday life and, and in situations like this, that we'll always be thinking, oh, we can also do this virtual version as well. Um, and that's something that, you know, is a positive thing because more people have access in that case. You know, I I, if I can add on to that too, I think, um, I, I think that as well. And I, and I think this is what I was mentioning with the student. It really surprised me the way the students were able to hands-on engage creatively as well. Yeah, in their own spaces, but I think that was a way to kind of connect, you know, to connect with the project. You know, Rose in Israel is interviewing, I think she interviewed Mildred, you know, um, and, you know, and making the mobile and, and making that story wall. And then that story wall, and I hope those of you who go will consider adding something up, you know, don't be intimidated by it, you know, um, or at least, or signing the book, you know, cause visiting is part of the experience as well, you know, actively visiting. And, and so the story, well, there's also elements on that web that Katie built in. So you can contribute your own story as well. And that was thought because even if you go physically to visit it's still in your isolated bubble or it's still in limited numbers. And that's kind of a way to communicate with other visitors as well. And that's maybe it would have, they would have come up with that without COVID. But, you know, when they were making those plans too we were in a different level but there was still this isolation that was thought about. So I agree that kind of ways it's forcing us to connect with one another it's you know um interesting <laughs> um so there is a, a virtual tour for the exhibition uh that's going to be up uh, uh the virtual tour actually it stays up beyond the time of the of the physical exhibition uh the link has been posted here on the chat uh, you, you can visit the, the exhibition online if you're not in the province. And we should have that exhibition up until probably June this year. Uh, and if we don't have any more comments or questions, like I want to deeply thank uh, Kelly Totten for reaching out and trying to put this project together with the gallery in a time that we didn't even know what 
we are doing uh, for this exhibition. Uh, this journey has been amazing. And when Kelly Butler project was brought into the equation, like it was even more impacting in, in my personal life in like learning and, and understanding. Uh, it was fantastic. Um, I cannot express how glad I am that we're gonna be reopening our doors to the public uh, without appointments um, as of next week. Uh, please come and see this exhibition. Uh, it is a marvelous exhibition. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of information that you can learn from that. Uh, and just to be in the presence of uh, so many hands. Uh, and, and that's how I see uh, every day that I look at the belt and like having a look through the book that has been signed by everyone. Like it, it, it's being the presence of so many hands and so many thoughts. Uh, and, and that is the most incredible feeling that one can have when we're talking about art and when we're talking about history and especially when we combine both of those things. Um, we have a few less comments. Uh, we are very excited and is the gallery open on Sundays? Unfortunately, we are not open on Sundays. Uh, and thank you so much for the fantastic session. I will look forward to the virtual tour and seeing the belt in person at some point in the future. Uh, just informing everyone, the exhibition is open until April 9th, 2021. Uh, this video is gonna be going up uh, in the end of this weekend. Uh, so if you wanna share, share this video, uh, share the link uh, for the virtual tour. Uh, I also posted the student's website, which is an incredible website. Uh, thank you so much everyone for being here tonight. Thank you so much Kelly and Kelly for giving the gallery this opportunity and for being open to this conversation and, and teaching us as much as we can in this short time. Uh, if anyone has any questions that they don't want to ask right now and please email the gallery, I'll make sure that I will forward this email to the curators of the project uh, and they will be in contact with you whenever they can. Um, and if Kelly or Kelly has any final words. No, just thank you. And thanks everyone for coming and thanks for the weavers for being here too and <laughs> sharing your stories. Same here, just thanks. Thank you, Bruno. And thank you for everyone that came tonight and chatted and asked questions. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great evening and be safe, be healthy and reach out. Bye-bye.